Hi everyone, my name is Michael O'Donnell, and today I'm going to be discussing Chapter 6 titled Political Pranksters and Prank Blowback from the book Pranksters Making Mischief in the Modern World. The book was written by Kembrew McLeod and was published by NYU Press in April of 2014. So according to McLeod's Wikipedia page, he is an artist, an activist, and a professor of communication studies at the University of Iowa. So before I get into the summary of the reading, I would like to provide some context to it first. I could not find exactly why McLeod wrote the book, but from the context of chapter 6 and a description from the book's Amazon page, I believe he wrote the book to show how pranks can disrupt the status quo of society and politics, which makes people question their own beliefs much like art. It also shows how easily mass media spreads misinformation. Since it is a book, I had trouble finding if anyone has cited it. In my last video, I was able to find information with altmetrics uh, for Duarte's paper, but I could not find anything for books, um, but I'm sure their ideas did not look hard enough. Uh, so with that said, I was unable to find how it contributed to other literature in the field or how it has affected the field. So now that I've given some context to the reading, I'm going to jump into the summary. So the chapter starts off by explaining how Ken Kesey, a novelist, essayist, and counterculture figure, launched the merry pranksters that were big on psychedelic drugs. Uh, this was like big during like the counterculture era of like the 60s around that time. So they bought a school bus and tricked it out into a psychedelic musical party bus. They drove it up and down the West Coast playing songs by the Grateful Dead. And their intention with this was to pull people out of their routines to imagine a world of weirdness. And stunts like this led the group to an abundance of pranks in the 60s that revolved around different forms of media. So the chapter goes on to explain other pranksters that messed with the media and the fall that ensued with some of the groups after their pranks. I'm going to briefly summarize each one that McLeod covers. And as a side note, I just want to give a context warning for this chapter. Uh, there's a couple stories that are quite graphic and, and lewd, um, especially once McLeod covers on the topic of JFK. So once you get to that point in the reading, just a heads up. So the first political prankster that McLeod looks at is Paul Kressner, uh, who is an author, a journalist, and comedian. Uh, Kressner started the magazine called The Realist in 1958, which was a part of the counterculture media scene. Many of these had political elements tailored towards leftists and younger audience. Uh, and the magazine had around 100,000 subscribers at its peak. Paul Krasner was quite influential and had a few pranks that McLeod delves into. So the first prank was that he had a bunch of people that read his magazine mail absurd complaints to an NBC game show called Masquerade Party to mess with the people working at NBC. Uh, he also had a poster in the magazine called F Communism, because both words at the time were considered repulsive to show, how peop to show people how ridiculous they are for caring about these words. So he also wrote a book called The Parts Left Out of the Kennedy Book that was quite inappropriate. Um, since it was so vulgar, the mainstream media picked up on it but had a hard time describing it because they didn't want to discuss what, the, what was in the book. He also never labeled anything as satire because he wanted the readers to ha have to discern what was real or not. <laughs> so the next prankster that McLeod looks at um, that liked to mess with the media um, from this around this time era is Joey Skaggs, who's a famous prankster. Um, his first prank was having a bus full of hippies uh, sightsee or suburban queens to get a reaction from the suburbanites who normally saw people who looked like fellow suburbanites tour the Queens area and um, the Associated Press ended up reporting on this story. He then posted an ad for a dog brothel that had people legitimately respond to it. Uh, he hired actresses and actors to play the parts of it, which got the media's attention since they were unaware that this was a, a play. And um, Skag did this to educate audiences about mass media's role in spreading misinformation. So McCloyd move, then moves on to back to Krasner, who helped co-find the, the Yippies, or Youth International Party. Uh, and he founded this along with Abby Hoffman, a political and social activist, and Jerry Rubin, a social activist, anti-war leader, and counterculture icon. So their first prank was throwing $200 and $1 bills in the gallery of the stock exchange, which ended up stopping trading for about six minutes. Um, they then held an anti-war rally with 50,000 people that dressed up as medieval characters. And to get attention for this rally, they held a press conference where they demonstrated a fake drug that was told it made people that that made people want to have sex, which they showed live in front of the press. Um, and then moving on, Hoffman was arrested for measuring the side of the Pentagon, and then he said he was doing so to measure how many witches were going to be needed for the event. And this helps show how like the magical aesthetic was adopted by some counterculture groups. 
So the Yippies also planned a protest of disrupting the Democratic National Convention, or DNC, by running a pig for president and by jokingly saying that they put LSD in Chicago's water supply. And the band, uh, excuse me, the band MC5 played for the rally, which sparked a riot essentially, and landed eight protest leaders in court dubbed the Chicago Eight trial. Uh, back to Krasner, he was a witness in this trial and he went on the stand high on LSD. Um, Hoffman, Rubin, and Black Panther leader Bobby Seal were also arrested during this. And during this event, or like the court session, um, no one in it took it seriously and they, like, they pretty much made a joke out of it by like wearing different costumes and like acting outrageous and stuff. Um, so when, well, when this happened with Bobby Seal, uh, he ended up getting bounded and gagged while the others weren't, uh, who were white. Uh, so this inadvertently showed how racist the judge and court were. So the Black Panthers also used the media to get their messages across. Uh, so for one example is that they went to the California State Capitol geared up with guns and sported black berets and leather jackets. Uh, they scared away then Governor Ronald Reagan, which brought in news crews. Um, Huey Newton was then able to use the media to read a speech to many Americans that reached both black and white Americans. And this was just one tactic they used, but it is noted that the Black Panthers were actually pros at getting the media to put a spotlight on their issues. So for example, they told the press that until a new spotlight, stoplight was installed in a street where a few children were run over and nothing was done by the city that they would have armed guards standing there and because of this the media attention the city quickly put in a stoplight because of it in fact the black panthers were so successful with manipulating the media that the fbi made cointel pro a counterintelligence agency to combat them and other groups um, so this group made by the fbi also created fake newspapers in the underground scene to try to promote more moderate ideas to the counterculture groups um, and the FBI group also made disturbing propaganda about black people to, to erase support um, by, from white leftists. And this FBI group also used pranks to get black people and Jewish people to turn on one another. And this group tried to instill fear into new left groups by sending odd messages to scare the members. So McLeod then goes on to describe how women were mostly left out of these pranks by these new progressive groups that were trying to dismantle the hegemonic systems at and they were repeating it within their own groups. And it is noted that many leftist men uh, patronized the women of the groups, and many of these women were the ones who made the speeches for the pranks. Now, an exception to this was the Women's Caucus within the Yippies that formed a subgroup called Society for Condemning Rape and Exploitation of Women, etc., etc., or Screwy. In 1968, they led a demonstration at the Miss America pageant. They used many shocking tactics, such as using a sheep to parody how the contestants were judged in the contest. It garnered media attention and ended up with a lie being spread by the media that they burned bras, which snowballed into many people thinking that they did that they did burn the bras, which ended up hurting their image, actually. And it is noted that bras at the time were very uncomfortable, pretty terrible, and quite oppressive. Um, but this narrative, either way, was still used against the women's movement to hurt them. Um, now, the members of the group did come forward and admit that their protest didn't, the protest flyers didn't explicitly say that they were against just the pageant and not the contestants themselves, and I think that this ended up hurting the cause as well. So the last group that's looked at by McCloyd are members of which, or Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. Um, in 1969, they led a demonstration at a bridal fair in Mar uh, Madison Square Garden, um, and this coven released mice into the crowd to show the stereotype of women jumping on the chairs and screaming, but instead the women at the uh, bridal fair actually tried to save the mice, so it kind of showed them wrong. And this ended up having the feminists criticized for turning off potential feminists because of this. Um, and then after that, uh, far-right religious groups started using witchcraft and Satanism as a talking point, saying that witches and Satanists were poisoning society, which led to a back-and-forth debacle that lasted for years. So McCloyd concludes the chapter by saying that pranks can disrupt the media and the culture we live in, and that, uh, and which can dismantle it. It shows how ideas from alternative media and mainstream media are also intertwined. Um, and these cases also show that political pranks can have consequences that were not thought of when originally thinking of what the prank. Um, and I also wanted to add a personal note. I think it seems a bit misogynist that the author only included, included criticism uh, about the feminists when the other pranksters could have easily been criticized too. So for example, I thought Krasner's book was like quite disturbing. And I, I personally think at the time that it probably would have turned many people away who would have been like right to criticize the president. Um, so I think maybe it seems that McLeod 
kind of might be the contributing to what he said the leftist groups were doing to a bit. Um, but yeah, so I guess what are all your thoughts on that? And but on a positive note, I do think the book was pretty was an accessible read and got his point across very well. Again, which was that um, how pranks can disrupt the media and kind of show how weird society can be sometimes. So anyways, this piece left me with some thoughts and some questions. Uh, so for one, I, w I was wondering, but why was this piece included in a module about hacking and hacktivism? So personally, I think even though like it doesn't go into hacking or hacktivism, like it does have political activism with the media. And I think that this could very definitely correlate modern day or to the modern day, uh, like social media and media uh, where like hacktivism does happen. Um, so what are all your thoughts on that? And which leads me to my next question. Are there modern day examples with social media or other online platforms where people have done similar pranks to what McLeod explained in the book? Um, so when I was reading this, for me, what came to mind was the show Nathan For You, where Nathan Fielder regularly uses Craigslist to hire people to participate in pranks, which even though like most of them aren't really political and it's kind of stupid, but uh, yeah, that's just what came to mind for me. Um, so anyways, yeah, what, what are all your thoughts? Uh, and yeah, thanks for watching. Have a great day.